Part two of Letters from a Cat by H. H. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. Chapter four. My dear Helen, there is one thing that cats don't like any better than men and women do, and that is to make fools of themselves. But a precious fool I made of myself when I wrote you that long letter about Mary's moving out all the furniture and taking the house down. It is very mortifying to have to tell you how it all turned out, but I know you love me enough to be sorry that I should have had such a terrible fright for nothing. It went on from bad to worse for three more days after I wrote you. Your mother did not come home, and the awful Irish woman was here all the time. I did not dare to go near the house, and I do assure you I nearly starved. I used to lie under the rose bushes and watch as well as I could what was going on. Now and then I caught a rat in the barn, but that sort of hearty food never has agreed with me since I came to live with you and became accustomed to a lighter diet. By the third day I felt too weak and sick to stir so i lay still all day on the straw in charlie's stall and i really thought between the hunger and the anxiety that i should die about noon i heard mary say in the shed i do believe that everlasting cat has taken herself off it's a good riddance anyhow but i should like to know what has become of the plaguey thing I trembled all over, for if she had come into the barn, I know one kick from her heavy foot would have killed me, and I was quite too weak to run away. Towards night I heard your dear mother's voice calling, Poor pussy, why, poor pussy, where are you? I assure you, my dear Helen, people are very much mistaken who say, as I have often overheard them, that cats have no feeling. If they could only know how I felt at that moment, they would change their minds. I was almost too glad to make a sound. It seemed to me that my feet were fastened to the floor, and that I never could get to her. She took me up in her arms and carried me through the kitchen into the sitting room. Mary was frying cakes in the kitchen, and as your mother passed by the stove, she said, in her sweet voice, You see, I found poor pussy, Mary. Hm, said Mary, I never thought but that she'd be found fast enough when she wanted to be. I knew that this was a lie, because I had heard what she said in the shed. I do wish I knew what makes her hate me so. I only wish she knew how I hate her. I really think I shall gnaw her stockings and shoes some night. It would not be any more than fair. And she would never suspect me. There are so many mice in her room, for I never touch one that I think belongs in her closet. The sitting room was all in most beautiful order. A smooth white something like the side of a basket over the whole floor. A beautiful paper curtain, pink and white, over the fireplace and white muslin curtains at the windows. I stood perfectly still in the middle of the room for some time. I was too surprised to stir. Oh, how I wished that I could speak and tell your dear mother all that had happened and how the room had looked three days before. Presently she said, Poor pussy, I know you are almost starved, aren't you? And I said, Yes, as plainly as I could mew it. Then she brought me a big soup plate full of thick cream and some of the most delicious cold hash I ever tasted. And after I had eaten it all, she took me in her lap and said, Poor pussy, we miss little Helen, don't we? And she held me in her lap till bedtime. Then she let me sleep on the foot of her bed. It was one of the happiest nights of my life. In the middle of the night I was up for a while and caught the smallest mouse I ever saw out of the nest. Such little ones are very tender. 
in the morning i had my breakfast with her in the dining room which looks just as nice as the sitting room after breakfast mrs hitchcock came in and your mother said only think how fortunate i am mary did all the house cleaning while i was away every room is in perfect order all the woollen cloths are put away for the summer poor pussy here was frightened out of the house and i suppose we should all have been if we had been at home can you imagine how ashamed i felt i ran under the table and did not come out again till after mrs hitchcock had gone but now comes the saddest part of my story soon after this i was looking out of the window i saw the fattest most tempting robin on the ground under the cherry tree the windows did not look as if they had any glass in them and i took it for granted that it had all been taken out and put away upstairs with the andirons and the carpets for next winter i knew that there was no time to be lost if i meant to catch that robin so i ran with all my might and tried to jump through oh my dear helen i do not believe you ever had such a bump i fell back nearly into the middle of the room and it seemed to me that i turned completely over at least six times the blood streamed out of my nose and i cut my right ear very badly against one of the casters of the table i could not see nor hear anything for some minutes when i came to myself i found your dear mother holding me and wiping my face with her own nice handkerchief wet in cold water my right forepaw was badly bruised and that troubles me very much about washing my face and about writing but the worst of all is the condition of my nose everybody laughs who sees me and i do not blame them it is twice as large as it used to be and i begin to be seriously afraid it will never return to its old shape this will be a dreadful affliction for who does not know that the nose is the chief beauty of a cat's face i have got very tired of hearing the story of my fall told to all the people who come in they laugh as if they would kill themselves at it especially when i do not manage to get under the table before they look to see how my nose is except for this i should have written to you before and would write more now but my paw aches badly and one of my eyes is nearly closed from the swelling of my nose so i must say good-bye your affectionate pussy p s i told you about caesar did i not in my last letter of course i do not venture out of the house in my present plight so i have not seen him except from the window chapter five my dear helen i am sure you must have wondered why i have not written to you for the last two weeks but when you hear what i have been through you will only wonder that i am alive to write to you at all I was very glad to hear your mother say yesterday that she had not written to you about what had happened to me because it would make you so unhappy but now that it is all over and i am in a fair way to be soon as well as ever i think you will like to hear the whole story in my last letter i told you about the new black cat caesar who had come to live in the nelson house and how anxious i was to know him as soon as my nose was fit to be seen judge dickinson's cat who is a good hospitable old soul in spite of her stupidity invited me to tea and asked him too all the other cats were asked to come later in the evening and we had a grand frolic hunting rats in the judge's great barn caesar is certainly the handsomest and most gentlemanly cat i ever saw he paid me great attention in fact so much that one of those miserable half-starved cats from mill valley grew so jealous that she flew at me and bit my ear till it bled which broke up the party but caesar went home with me so i did not care then we sat and talked a long time under the nursery window i was so much occupied in what he was saying that i did not hear mary open the window overhead 
and was therefore terribly frightened when there suddenly came down on us a whole pailful of water i was so startled that i lost all presence of mind and without bidding him good-night i jumped directly into the cellar window by which we were sitting oh my dear helen i can never give you any idea of what followed instead of coming down as i expected to on the cabbages which were just under that window the last time i was in the cellar i found myself sinking sinking into some horrible soft slimy sticky substance which in an instant more would have closed over my head and suffocated me but fortunately as i sank i felt something hard on one side and making a great effort i caught on to it with my claws it proved to be the side of a barrel and i succeeded in getting one paw over the edge of it there i hung growing weaker and weaker every minute with this frightful stuff running into my eyes and ears and choking me with its bad smell i mewed as loud as i could which was not very loud for whenever i opened my mouth the stuff trickled into it off my whiskers but i called to caesar who stood in great distress at the window and explained to him as well as i could what had happened to me and begged him to call as loudly as possible for if somebody did not come very soon and take me out i should certainly die he insisted at first on jumping down to help me himself but i told him that would be the most foolish thing he could do if he did we should certainly both be drowned so he began to mew at the top of his voice and between his mewing and mine there was noise enough for a few minutes then windows began to open and i heard your grandfather swearing and throwing out a stick of wood at caesar fortunately he was so near the house that it did not hit him at last your grandfather came downstairs and opened the back door and caesar was so frightened that he ran away for which i have never thought so well of him since though we are still very good friends when i heard him running off and calling back to me from a distance that he was so sorry he could not help me my courage began to fail and in a moment more i should have let go of the edge of the barrel and sunk to the bottom but luckily your grandfather noticed that there was something very strange about my mewing and opened the door at the head of the cellar stairs saying i do believe the cat is in some trouble down here then i made a great effort and mewed still more piteously how i wished i could call out and say yes indeed i am drowning to death in i'm sure i don't know what but something a great deal worse than water however he understood me as it was and came down with a lamp as soon as he saw me he set the lamp down on the cellar bottom and laughed so that he could hardly move i thought this was the most cruel thing i ever heard of if i had not been as it were at death's door i should have laughed at him too for even with my eyes full of that dreadful stuff i could see that he looked very funny in his red nightcap and without his teeth he called out to mary and your mother who stood at the head of the stairs come down come down here's the cat in the soft soap barrel and then he laughed again and they both came down the stairs laughing even your dear kind mother who i never could have believed would have laughed at any one in such trouble they did not seem to know what to do at first nobody wanted to touch me and i began to be afraid i should drown while they stood looking at me for i knew much better than they could how weak i was from holding on to the edge of the barrel so long at last your grandfather swore that oath of his you know the one i mean the one he always swears when he is very sorry for anybody and lifted me out by the nape of my neck holding me as far off from him as he could for the soft soap ran off my legs and tail in streams he carried me up into the kitchen and put me down in the middle of the floor and then they all stood round me and laughed again so loud that they waked up the cook who came running out of her bedroom with her tin candlestick and a chair in her hand thinking that robbers were breaking in 
at last your dear mother said poor pussy it is too bad to laugh at you when you are in such pain i had been thinking so for some time mary bring the small wash tub the only thing we can do is to wash her when i heard this i almost wished they had left me to drown in the soft soap for if there is anything of which i have a mortal dread it is water however i was too weak to resist and they plunged me in all over into the tub full of ice-cold water and mary began to rub me with her great rough hands which i assure you are very different from yours and your mother's then they all laughed again to see the white lather it made in two minutes the whole tub was as white as the water under the mill-wheel that you and i have so often been together to see you can imagine how my eyes smarted i burnt my paws once in getting a piece of beefsteak out of the coals where it had fallen off the gridiron but the pain of that was nothing to this you will hardly believe me when i tell you that they had to empty the tub and fill it again ten times before the soap was all washed out of my fur by that time i was so cold and exhausted that i could not move and they began to think i should die but your mother rolled me up in one of your old flannel petticoats and made a nice bed for me behind the stove by this time even mary began to seem sorry for me though she was very cross at first and hurt me very much more than she need to in washing me now she said you're nothing but a poor beast of a cat to be sure but it's meself that would be sorry to have the little mistress come back and find ye kilt so you see your love for me did me a service even when you were so far away i doubt very much whether they would have ever taken the trouble to nurse me through this sickness except for your sake but i must leave the rest for my next letter i am not strong enough yet to write more than two hours at a time your affectionate pussy End of part two